Okay, this is another video from our video lecture series. This one is for Jim. Jim asked a question relating to, uh, he knows somebody who lost uh, use of hands, has sounds like numbness, tingling, and spasticity in the hands. So we're gonna talk about the difference between losing, losing function in the hands in terms of is it spastic or is it is it uh, uh, flaccid, meaning uh, kind of dead hands? So we'll call this dead hands versus versus uh, spasticity. When we look at the hands uh, in terms of their neurology, we have to have to realize that the brain, the brain controls the the arms and hands. It does so through a series of circuits, and it it does so also with in conjunction with the the cerebellum and so there's a lot of different things that are going on to control the hands now it's all of that is based on the reflexes that you have in your arms and hands the the ability to flex the ability to extend the ability to feel movement while we're doing that all of that is what we call the reflexogenic system and the the brain the the brain stem the the basal ganglia and the brain play off of those reflexes to use them to make more fine movements and controlled and sensical uh, movements to do whatever it is that we're going to do. And some of the most difficult things that we do are speech, hand movements, and walking, walking and talking. So when you lose function within the hands, when you lose sensory, you have within, within your hands a sensory loop it feels different things it can feel pain it can feel heat or cold we call that thermal it can feel things like uh, pressure deep pressure light touch pressure it can feel vibration it can feel if there's two points being you know being touched and it can also experience uh, to help you to visualize in your mind what kind of thing that you have in your hand, whether it's a coin or a pen, you can tell the difference. I mean, there are, there are lots of different functions. They also have a motor side to the loop, which is what makes those move, whether it's flexion movements, whether it's extension movements, whether we're bringing, bringing the fingers apart, whether we're bringing them together. All those functions are based on movements that we have housed in our spinal cord that are reflexogenic. They, if, if we tap something, we're gonna, get a, we're gonna get a reflex so that we sense it and then we move it. If we start to lose function in our hands, if we start to lose feeling, if we lose feeling, we're starting to lose the sensory side to that loop. And it may or may not initially have an impact on the, on the, the motor side or the, the reflexes. It is though going to have uh, an effect on the brain above it, on the spinal cord, brain stem, basal ganglia, and brain. Anything that happens in the periphery of our body is going to have an impact on our brain. Anything that we've got going on in our brain always has an impact on how we function our body, always. And so those two things always exist. But when we talk about the hand, we're talking about an area within the spinal cord where those reflexes are housed, an area within the, within the spinal cord that is in the low part of the neck. When we draw what's called the, the, the brachial plexus, draw it very quickly here. We got C5, six, seven, eight, and T1. And we are going to create a basal, I mean, we're going to create a, a brachial plexus here. And without drawing the rest of this stuff, this one is going to go into the biceps and shoulders. So if the problem is up here in the neck, it's going to affect out here into the shoulder. If it happens, if you're experiencing it in the hand, the hand is going to be contributed by uh, C8 and T1, C7, C8 and T1, but primarily C8 and T1. And it's going to be primarily, this is the musculus cutaneous, 
This one is the radius. This is the ulna, and this is the medial nerve, median nerve. And it's primarily these that are that are within the hand. When we have a, an issue that goes into the hand, we have to say, okay, when when we're dealing with a motor part of that issue, it's not functioning. Is it spastic, or is it a, more like dead hands? We call it flaccid paralysis. If it is flaccid, meaning it's just going dead and it can't move it, and, and that, and it's not not tight or spasm, spasm, that is what we call a lower motor neuron lesion. That means that it's something outside the spinal cord, or particularly what we call the ventral, the ventral horn. We're not going to get into that today but it's going to be happening from here down. That is going to give us a flaccidity. That's going to give us a, uh, what I call dead hands. It can be associated with, with numbness, loss of vibration sense, loss of, uh, uh, loss of uh, sense of, of where, where are those things in sense, proprioception and all that, but it will be happening from here down. If it's associated with spasticity, it's actually going to be happening up in the spinal cord Above, if we look at the spinal cord here real quickly, if we look at the spinal cord, okay, we have a pool of neurons here, and they are the out neurons, and these are the in. This is where all the sensations come in, this is where everything goes out. This pool of neurons receives in information or tell, is told what to do by other neurons that are coming up to it. If it's happening at these neurons and out, it is a part of the peripheral nervous system. Anything that is beyond that, within the cord, is going to give you spasticity. If it's happening in the brainstem, it's going to create spasticity. If it's happening, we cross it over in the brainstem, in the basal ganglia, uh, in, the, in the mesencephalon, the basal ganglia, or the brain, it's going to be a spastic type paralysis. So that gives us a, an indication we can start looking in there for the, for the answers to the problem and that. So this is, this is how we differentiate dead hands, which is a, per, is a lower motor problem versus versus spastic and which is upper. Now I want to end with talking about what if what if the doctor we, we see that it's spastic but the doctor did an MRI and there's no disc bulges or disc herniations, so we, we don't know why that could be happening. That is an excellent question. We see that a lot in our clinic, uh, with or without bulging or herniating discs. But the reversal of the curve, when you lose the curve in your neck, it stretches the spinal cord. And so the spinal cord itself actually gets smaller. We call it functional stenosis. It's a tethering or a stretching of the cord. When you stretch a rubber band, it gets thicker. No, it doesn't. It gets thinner, right? You stretch a rubber band, it gets thicker. When you stretch a spinal cord, or a thinner, when you stretch a rubber band, it gets thinner. When you stretch a, a spinal cord, it gets thinner. Because it gets thinner, it decreases the blood flow within the cord itself and the brainstem. And that can facilitate the spasticity just by itself and by working with those discs and getting them to change by, by working with the molding and the weights and decompression, changing the shape of those discs so that now they have a, a new position and they take the stretch off the cord and now the spasticity goes away. And so that's, that's uh, something that we see on a regular basis here in the office. Uh, hope that answered your question. If you have any more questions related to this, we'll, we'll uh, be happy to do another another video relating to it. But excellent question, Jim, and hope you have a wonderful day.